SPUR stands for the Summer Program in Undergraduate Research. It is a joint appointment with the Whiting School of Engineering as well as the Applied Physics Lab. I worked in the Autonomous Control Division, and specifically working on implementing an architecture that allows us to you know, determine the optimal grasp for the modular prosthetic limb. The idea here is to restore um, human-like dexterity to people who have either lost their limbs uh, or for spinal cord injury patients who also cannot use their limbs. And our goal was to essentially minimize the cognitive burden that is placed on these patients. Those two points that we can just... You're thinking, you know, that's the mug that I want. And then you allow the computer vision and the autonomous controls to figure out, okay, how is the best way for me to get to that object? And what is the best grasp to use based on the geometric properties of that object? The challenge of grasp autonomy is a very complex problem. And the problem becomes exponentially more difficult when you're working with a robotic arm that has a very high number of degrees of freedom. So I spent the first week um, evaluating different open source grass planners. Then during the integration process, uh, I worked on you know, writing code, modifying that algorithm uh, to fit what we thought would work best for the modular prosthetic limb. Having that much responsibility was a lot of pressure. There were m multiple occasions where I was stuck. Uh, but while I kept working on it, and in addition to getting help from a lot of you know very talented engineers at the Applied Physics Lab, we were able to figure out a lot of the, the difficulties. You know, spending time working with interns is an investment on your part too but the Spur interns, they were very high caliber students. And I think Farhan's contributions were great. The Spur program was funded by the Hopkins trustee, Heather Murren, as well as her husband, Jim. I can't say how thankful you know, I am because it's definitely kickstarted my professional career. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to have the opportunity to continue working at the Applied Physics Lab uh, you know, as a temp on call and knowing that the work I did this summer uh, will go to clinical trials, it will eventually improve the quality of life of someone at the end of the day, is, is a very powerful feeling. So I hope that whetted your appetite. I will say, as we think about these programs and what we take out around the country and around the world, one of the challenges is for those of us who get to walk the, the campuses every single day. You turn corners and discover some of the amazing things that are happening in the classrooms and in the labs. And one of the challenges is how do you export those to places like Miami and Chicago and London? And so we're trying to go out and take some of the very best moments and share them with you in person. And I think tonight we have absolutely done this. So I want you to think about this evening as a chance for us to bring just one example of the incredible work that's happening at Johns Hopkins and share it with you tonight. I'd like to introduce and call our panelists up. They'll give their own self-introductions, but I'd like you to welcome Albert Chi, Courtney Moran, Farhan Damani, Mike McLaughlin, and Johnny Matheny, and tonight's conversation leader, the university's vice provost for research, Denis Wirtz. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Fritz, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, let me begin by echoing Fritz's comments. Um, I wish to thank, thank each of you uh, for the amazing support you've provided to our students and, and faculty uh, for introducing Johns Hopkins to great donors, great partners, and we very much on behalf of uh, uh, Farhan uh, to provide them with jobs once they graduate. Um, your support and advocacy is really uh, critical to propelling uh, this great university forward, uh, bringing the benefits of our research and scholarship uh, to the world. Uh, our work, um, your work, is, is truly important and not only important to faculty and students, but even for myself. And, and let me explain what I mean by this. Um, I do a lot of um, 
mundane work, like making sure proposal get out the door, stuff like that. Um, but that does what doesn't keep me at, uh, awake at night. What keeps me awake at night is making sure our undergrads and and students like Farhan get a real opportunity to do the great work they can do. Um, really matching those great students with great project. That takes effort. That takes uh, resources and. Um, we have such resources, and they are uh, really very much exemplified by the, the SPUR program. Um, we have also Provost Undergraduate Research uh, Award. We have a Dura, Dean Univers Undergraduate Research Award. Those are great. They're about 50, 60 uh, per year. But there are hundreds of applicants, uh, with a, very much a mismatch between the number of students, talented students, eager students, who want to do that research, and number of fellowship we can give them to spend a whole summer, for instance, free of, uh, of coursework, free of worries, financial or otherwise, and do the work they really want to do. Um, so your effort, your gift can make that difference, can provide those great students for those opportunities. I do many other things, uh, actually, and it's all about really matching um, the talent we have of, with our students and, and faculty and uh, potential sources of funding. And that starts with the Catalyst Award. This is great vision for the present. Really, um, our uh, beginning uh, early career faculty, when they get started, a lot to, to think about. They have to develop the courses, of course. Um, they have to develop their own research programs. Um, and it's in a world that's becoming more and more competitive. Fast-moving world, they often are in fields that are moving very fast. Um, that takes money, that takes effort, um, and we wanted to help them ensure they'd be as competitive as they can be uh, through a seed catalyst award. And that's gonna be exemplifying what I've been talking about, which is we received 180 proposals, only 33 were funded. It's not because our young faculty are not talented or because they didn't get high scores, they actually did. It's again a bit of a mismatch between the talent pool we have, in this case faculty, and the resources we can make available to them. Um, it's the Frontier Award, unbelievable celebration of intellectual prowess. Uh, our first inaugural recipient of this award, Sean Gerhardt, actually a colleague of mine in chemical and biomolecular engineering, she's been pioneering new approaches in tissue uh, engineering how to develop new organs on the ship, if you will. Um, uh, for, for instance, drug testing that wouldn't use animals, for instance. Um, how to better mimic a growing tumor. Well, this is fine and nice, but that's one recipient. We had more than 100 applicants for this award. Um, so your generosity, your advocacy, your support, as you can see, are critical to ensure our students, our faculty, are as successful as they can be. It's also, um, as I said, a bit playing matchmaker. Matchmaker between students who are seeking those opportunities and faculty, engineers, professional staff, for instance, at APL, who are eager to host, to get these faculty, these students in the lab, like it was explained in the video. Um, APL is the nation's largest university-affiliated research center. Um, it's the who's who in engineering is the what's what in project in terms of uh, clinical applications, uh, defense, uh, and everything in between. A lot of students would like to have access to those facilities, to those opportunities. Again, a bit of a mismatch there. We need to scale that up. We need to offer not a bit, you know, five, six, seven a year uh, part of this per program. We need 20, 30, 40. Um, so uh, uh, let's begin our conversation uh, with this great panel um, assembled today. Um, it really, uh, to me, epitomizes what, what I've, I'm talking about, what Johns Hopkins is about. It's, it's a, a, a world-class surgeon, it's, it's a kick-ass undergrad, it's a, um, a, a, a patient and, and fantastic patient, uh, uh, in Johnny, it's uh, engineers in uh, Courtney and Mike who together, a priori, have little in common, but came together into a, an amazing project that's changing the world, changing Johnny's life and changing many other patients' lives. Um, so, 
to make sure this conversation is, is in, uh, interactive. Um, we're going to go through uh, quick uh, self-introductions, but I'd like you to prepare some uh, questions you may have as you hear those short introductions. Um, so without further ado, let's start with um, uh, Albert, and why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Well, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Albert Chi. I'm a trauma surgeon at Johns Hopkins Hospital, but I'm also a lieutenant commander in the Navy. I just recently returned from serving in Operation Enduring Freedom as the Director of Surgical Services in Northern Africa. And really, I have the best job in the entire world. I have a biomedical engineering background, but every day I get to combine both my passions of surgery and engineering and apply that to people with traumatic injuries. And not just traumatic injuries, the studies and everything we're doing now can be applied to those wounded warriors returning home, which I have first experience of. So Courtney, you want to explain your role in the project? Sure. Um, I think I might have turned. Can anyone hear me? Hold on. I think I might have turned. There we go. Uh, we're, we're all robots up here with turn of power on. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, so I'm actually a clinical prosthetist. I've been at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab um, working primarily on the uh, advanced prosthetic limb, modular prosthetic limb for the past eight years. Prior to that, I was in clinical practice. I also have a biomedical engineering uh, master's degree. So I kind of bridge the uh, research and, and clinical world. And I'm lucky to both have been able to see the um, development of the limb over the past seven years and also have been able to work with um, the patients that we couldn't have, have done this without who have given us the real insight that has allowed this to be a useful technology and um, have really been in the loop throughout that. So that's been something that I always wanted to be part of but isn't entirely um, common. And uh, through, through APL and Johns Hopkins have really had an opportunity to see that transition happen. Farhan? Uh, my name is Farhan Damani. I'm a senior undergraduate at Hopkins in the Whiting School of Engineering. Um, I actually started at Hopkins uh, in a, with, with a major of philosophy. Um, you know, I spent, I, I'm, seriously, I spent most of my time in high school, uh, you know, a lot of my free time reading about the philosophy of ethics. Um, I was obsessed with ethics and I was thoroughly convinced that's precisely what I wanted to do once I came to Hopkins. Um, but after I came, I took an introductory to programming course in the spring semester of my freshman year and fell in love with it. And I fell in love with it for very different reasons than I think a lot of, the computer, a lot of other computer scientists. Um, I saw this beautiful connection between the way philosophers proved ethical arguments, which was um, you know, very precise and was very mathematical, and in the same way uh, how computer scientists will persuade each other that their algorithm works. Um, that connection was interesting to me and I thought, hey, I can think in a very similar way that I loved when I read philosophy, but I can work on real problems that can hopefully help people. Um, fast forward a year and a half, I had, had this wonderful opportunity to be part of the SPUR program, um, and you know, I fortunately got placed in a pretty uh, amazing project with, um, and, you know, as you see, some very talented people. Um, it was an amazing summer, and it really kick-started um, you know, my passion for research and wanting to work on really difficult problems, and um, it's been great to you know, see that the work we did helped, it had some, had an impact, um, but since then, it's been great to be able to work on various other, you know, interesting research-related problems that um, Hopkins has been so gracious to offer me. That's great. Mike? Okay, hey, I'm Mike McLaughlin. I'm the Chief Engineer for Research and Exploratory Development at the Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, I've been at APL for 30 years now. <laughs> Uh, when I say it, that sounds like a really long time. It does, doesn't seem like it's been that long. Um, I, I'd actually have to disagree with Albert uh, on one point, is that I think I have the greatest job. <laughs> um, and that's why I've been there so long. And I think that the thing that's just been so fantastic about my career at APL is the, the opportunity to work on things that really matter. And we, we pride ourselves on, on the ability to not only develop technology, but actually take technology and get it in the hands of the people that need it. And for the past 10 years, we've been working this particular program that you're seeing tonight. And it was driven by a singular purpose of bringing technology forward that could help wounded warfighters. And it turns out in the process, that can help a lot of other people. And it's been, I think, the 
the capstone of my, my career and it is across the, the Johns Hopkins organization. It's just been an opportunity to, to work with just an absolutely fabulous group of people. Yeah, it's inspiring. Uh, Johnny, and last but not least, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about um, um, the, the origin of all this. You know, how, how you got involved and, and uh, how is this arm helping you? Uh, I can't sit down. <laughs> <laughs> I am the end result of everybody on this panel. I get to be able to work the most fascinating, the most advanced arm, not only in the United States, but the whole world. With this, you can be able to do everything that your normal hands, elbow, wrist can do. And it just, you know, it's just amazing what, what, can, what can happen with this. Anything that, you know, you just thought controlled, all brought on by Dr. Albert Chi doing targeted muscle re-innervation. And then with, uh, with the other, with APL, putting together this with the help of the military funding to start off with, you know, we've come together and we've got this great arm and we're able to hopefully, with the help of each and every one of you guys, put together the ultimate arm. It's going to be able to work, hold, help, feel, operate, full range of motion, just like your natural arm. Now can you imagine taking a plastic arm like this and holding your baby in your arms and be able to feel the baby? Be able to put your arm around your lovely better half and be able to feel their, the warmth of their skin. This is what we're looking at. This is the panel that's begun. This is the advancement. You've heard of Back to the Future. Where did it, where did it end? Where did it begin? 2015. Look at us now. The, the <laughs> Back to the Future is here. Yeah. It's got us. Thank you. Open uh, the floor for, for questions. Um, don't be shy. Yes, please. Uh, I just heard uh, uh, the word. I just heard feel. Um, could you explain that? Yes, it's beginning. The, this is the next step in the evolution uh, of the of the arm. We had the arm to uh, be able to work. Due to TMR, we're being able to operate it just like your normal stunt. Now, we've, now we're going to move into the next section to where you can tap into the nerve endings and you can put sensors throughout the hand, the arm, and it will be able to feel different things. Hypothetically, we, you know, of course, we're just, we're just in the beginning stages. Hypothetically, put a hood over me, start at the top of somebody, touch their hair, tell you whether it's got thin or thick hair, curly or straight hair, come down and, and touch the shirt and tell you whether it's going to be a silky feel, a cotton feel, a flannel feel. Cool to cold, warm to hot. When you, somebody wants to shake the hand, everybody wants to shake the hand because it's, because it's different. When you shake the hand, you know how much pressure you're putting on that hand. But that's, not, that's just the half of it. The other half is how much pressure they're going to give you back. The side effect of this is you get Mr. He-Man and he starts clamping down and he's going to put me to my knees. <laughs> just with, you know, on a plastic yeah, hand. You crush my hand. It's just that, that, that I want to live. But this, you know, the, the feel of it, it's like, you know, it, with a regular prosthetic arm, if you're like you're in a grocery store and you'd be walking down an aisle and you can bump a, a display and knock it over and never even know you hit it. Now you'll not only know you hit it, you'll be able to feel whether you hit an animate object or inanimate. If it was animate, did I bump uh, somebody's clothes or did I bump their skin? Did I just barely brush them? Or did you know, I bump them and went, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean to do that. Mm -hmm. this, just to this clarify the the what everybody is seeing today, I'm really, you're seeing the first demonstration of really the evolution of man and machine. Uh, Johnny here has a titanium implant that is going into his humerus that is supporting the modular prosthetic limb. He also has had a surgical procedure called targeted muscle re that reroutes his nerve endings that were cut to residual muscles that are still present 
And now he controls that limb simply by thinking those natural movements. And we record that muscle activity through a wireless band that you see there and that's communicating to the limb. And, uh, that, and that wireless band is actually a commercial gaming controller that we were able to adapt huh. to the arm and, and enable this better wireless interface by just using technology that is emerging in the market for other things and, and adapt it in the, in the modular element of this arm allows it to be adapted to a wide range of amputees, but also to be pretty easily configurable to a wide range of control elements. So you saw me out there controlling it with a cyber glove. Johnny's controlling it with this. We can use stick-on electrodes. We can use a socket. We can you know, use eye tracking through a Kinex device. There's a lot of pretty easy configurations that can be done, and, and, and that helps make this modular across all different types of rehab and uh, um, therapeutic applications and really tailor it to the, the person who's going to be using it in the best way that provides them the, the most benefit. One of the um, fundamental goals of this program was to restore this capability in a way that's very natural. And you heard some of that in the, in the discussion. So what we really wanted to do is somebody to think, this is not a prosthetic arm. This is actually my my natural arm because I'm controlling it in, in the same way that I controlled the arm that I lost. And we've seen that, uh, and Johnny can talk to that, and we've seen it with spinal cord injury patients and others that have, have used the arm. And we asked them the question, it, are you operating a machine or are you operating your arm? And many of them say is, I'm operating my arm because they actually perceive it as being not a piece of machinery, but actually an extension of themselves. And the most unique thing about this arm is, this is, most of the arms that you see out on the market today are called bionic arms. This is the first true robotic arm. This is an arm that I can be wearing here today. I can be doing a lot of work with it. And then they can, you know, the future's coming up with robots. Well, we can take this arm right off, put it on a robot, let the robot do the work. When they get done with it, bring it back, attach <laughs> it right back to me, and I just go on about my business with it. <laughs> So that's, what, that's why this is the most advanced arm, not just, you know, just in the United States, but in the world. I mean, you know, there's, there's nothing can, can be touched, you know, touch us on this, this deal right here. This is the advancements that John Hopkins and the Applied Physics Labs have made. I mean, just leaps and bounds, you know, above everybody. Gentlemen, what is the energy source for the arm? It is battery powered, which is right here. So it's just like your cordless drill. <clears throat> battery runs out, pull it out. Put in a new one. Yeah. So. Speaking of which, I can see a red light flashing on his armband. So if he loses control, it's because that's running low on battery. So we haven't quite come up with the never ending battery <laughs> yet. So if for some reason his control starts to go down here, it's actually the armband is, I'm seeing that kind of giving a little red flash. That probably means that's running low on rechargeable power. But um, he's been wearing it all night. So. Um, you know, that, that's to be expected at some point, but yeah, maybe someone can invent a uh, never-ending battery like uh, the never-ending gobstopper. <laughs> at, at the back and then at the front. Yeah. Just, just one more yeah. so that people online can listen. Yeah, thank you. I'm wondering whether you're also working on a leg, prosthetic leg. Yeah, our, yeah, and our focus has been on, on uh, prosthetic arms. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is technologically, it's actually much more challenging. If you think what you do with your hand compared to what you do with your foot and your toes, this is a, a much more complicated thing. Uh, it's really a, a marvel of nature. The other thing that inspired us is when we started this, this program, uh, and you hear it today, is you, you, you hear controversy about uh, you know, somebody that has prosthetic legs has an unfair advantage in a race with somebody that's, that has their legs. Uh, you don't hear that in upper extremity pro prosthetics, okay? And, and so our goal was to really kind of change that discussion so that, you know, now when, when Johnny shows up, you know, people say, oh, wait a minute, that's not fair. He has a, he has a prosthetic arm. <laughs> I was curious about issues, phantom sensation. Did you have any struggles with initially with phantom sensation when you had... Oh, yes. Right from the beginning, phantom pains. I'm talking phantom pains. It's just your, your hand just goes like this. Can you imagine 24-7, 365, your hand is just squeezing just as tight as it can be. Phantom pain just throbs. Once we got into the TMR and 
where the, the brain is sending signals down for the, for the arm to do something and you know, it just comes to a dead end. Once we did a TMR, opened the pathways back up, then the phantom pain started diminishing. The hand just started slowly coming back to a relaxed position. And then, you can, then it starts within your, within your mind's eye. You can just see you know, you, the movements of your hand doing the different things. Your wrist, your elbow. That, that was just, it started eliminating you know, the, the phantom pains. I still have some, even though you know, the, the phantom pain is, is mostly gone. When uh, it begins to rain, the barometric pressure drops. I still get some phantom pain on that. But, so does uh, that change the motor control for you when the sensation changes for you? No, no, that, that doesn't change the motor control. The, the pathways are still open, even though, you know, you're getting a little, it's, you know, uh, people that has arthritis, you know, when it, when it rains, they get, a, they get an ache. Mm -hmm. uh, that's basically, you know, what this feels like. It doesn't, it doesn't stop them from, from still working. It's just that constant, you know, that constant ache. I have a question for, for Mike, Courtney, and Albert. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how this project came about financially? I mean, this takes resources, it takes money, it takes personnel. Um, what kind of the size of a grant or contract you, you had to start with to even begin to think about putting together such a project? And where sure. do we stand today and, and what's needed uh, to move forward? Yeah, so, so we were very fortunate. So, so DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, took on this problem in, in 2005. And with the, I, so at that time we had many soldiers coming back with uh, amputations and really no good solutions for them. Mm -hmm. And so DARPA has invested over $120 million in this program. And so that, you know, and this is part of it. It's not the whole thing. We, we've looked at um, control directly with the brain by uh, utilizing brain implants, uh, just a whole host of technologies that we've now, because of that investment by the Department of Defense, have really these, these remarkable platform technologies. So it, it took us you know, $100 million to get to the point where we could put an arm on somebody. Now, for a few thousand dollars, we can bring somebody in a lab and wire them up and let them try it out. And it's all because of that, that, uh, that investment by the, the government. I was about to ask, I mean, Fritz mentioned how the average gift is about $6,000. What could you do with, maybe a question for Courtney and Albert, what could you do with $6,000, maybe with $60,000, $600,000, six million million? Uh, can you give us a, a scale of what cost to what? Um, um, one, one of the things we do at the early stages, you know, relative to this arm is that we also have a virtual training platform. So um, we can put avatar or virtual limbs representations on a tablet or a laptop. And especially now that we're interfacing with these off the shelf arm bands, that drives the cost way down. So we could do, you know, kind of these, put together these take home systems to enable someone to train up pattern recognition, which is the type of control Johnny's using here, so that when they do get an opportunity to use this arm or even um, uh, prosthetic devices off the shelf are now starting to be able to be controlled with pattern recognition, they, you know, they can improve um, at home, they, they, it can be used in a lot of different ways, so a, so a $6,000 gift could potentially um, furnish you know, probably three or four of those take home systems. My, from a clinical standpoint, um, I know we are talking about $120 million invested towards this technology, but where, where we're really lacking is the continuation and the clinical evaluation of the studies that are so grossly needed. And we've done some incredible firsts, and, and to talk about firsts at Johns Hopkins Hospital and firsts at APL, I mean, that's, it's, it's, you can, it's unbelievable to say that we can even do that. I mean, Johnny was the first TMR patient at Hopkins. Johnny was the first person to have sensory feedback experience with the MPL. Another patient of ours, Leslie Ba, had a bilateral shoulder disarticulation, had the first bilateral TMR sur surgery, and was the first person to simultaneously control bilateral MPLs with complete shoulder, elbow, wrist, and hand movement at the same time. And this may shock the audience, but we did all this really with a shoestring budget. I mean, all of this was done through volunteered hours of the engineers, uh, volunteered hours of Johnny and myself, 
um, there wasn't even funding for Johnny to have um, housing. I mean, really, Johnny talks about the hundreds and thousands or hundreds and hours that he spent training. Believe it or not, I was done on my couch in my house. So talk about $6,000. I mean, that would be such a luxury nice for us. I mean, really, I mean, Johnny, how many times have you paid for your gas just because you believe in the project to drive down on your own time to do this? Uh, I mean, it's, it seems like this project has so much money invested in it, but really, we've been doing all this really as a personal passion for each of us because we believe in the project. Great. John? Denny, here's a question from an online viewer, and she asks, what resources are available now to amputees and their families to explore and understand advanced prosthetics? <laughs> I, think, I think there's a lot of opportunities, um, but you have to know where to look. Um, we do have an external website at APL that, can, that is tailored to families and it can, can explain the technology. Um, the amputee, the, just the prosthetic website, um, if you do um, omp.com and those sort of things, by exploring that, o o OMP The Edge is one of the publications. It, can, it highlights a lot of different you know, research going on um, in, in various different elements, but the big, you know, the big thing is, is expressing an interest, you know, really fosters, you know, we, we're able to do this because Johnny expressed an interest and he takes the risk to kind of be the pioneer with some of these technologies. I mean, our job is to make sure that those risks are minimized and he's very safe, but he's still taking this risk. You know, he's still trying things that no one's tried before. And um, so by, you know, because Johnny and Les and all these people have said, you know, I want to, yeah, I want to, I want to give that a try in the hopes of, of enabling the technology to move forward so it maybe can help someone you know, one day, even if it can't help me personally, I mean, that's really asking the question, um, asking, you know, how to get involved, expressing a desire to get involved, you know, by, by reaching out, you know, through our website, through different resources is probably the best, best way to do that. I think, I think sometimes opportunities are created when you ask, you know, just as someone asks for them, because we're, we're looking to meet the needs of, of people that aren't being met. Great, great question. A question in the back there. Yes? How many Johnnies are there now? How many installations of an arm like this are there now? And is there a road to Johnny's the first person to have an implant in his upper arm in U.S. history. He's the very first amputee to get the, an implant in his arm. There's one person who's received that surgery in the United States for their lower leg right, for their fem femur in the U.S. I mean, they've been doing the surgery in yeah. Sweden and in Australia, but it's just now making its way to the United States. And Johnny was the first uh, amputee States, to receive yeah. it for his upper arm in the U.S. And um, the absolute first time we ever fit um, the, you know, the, the MPL and any dexterous arm, any, you know, fully dexterous prosthetic, meaning all the motions <coughs> are supported by the by the MPL to a direct skeletal attachment. And that, that just is a huge advancement and it definitely is moving forward. I think Johnny maybe can tell you he's the best advocate for moving that forward. Um, he actually puts a ton of effort into really doing, I mean, he's really an expert in this, so I'll pass it off. And just to make everybody feel special tonight as well, this is the first public demonstration that we've had that we wow. especially put together for wow. all of you tonight. The surgery, surgical procedure that Johnny has is uh, a nerve transfer procedure where we take a very large nerve ending and transfer that to actually a very small uh, connection to his residual muscles that are still there. Um, the exact number of neurons that are actually reconnecting, we actually don't know. When we do the training, um, I like to call it a, a symphony of information of muscle activity that we're able to record from multiple um, EMG electrodes, and really the, the hard and key to all of the surgery really is the, the training and the hard work that Johnny has to put in. The wonderful and brilliant people at 
the Applied Physics Lab, have come up with a virtual training system that we use exclusively for what I like to call virtual rehab. We're essentially creating a new field of medicine using this virtual reality environment and rehab training. And Johnny has put in, he's almost like an Olympic athlete with how much time and energy that he's dedicated to this. But you're seeing the wonderful demonstration here with multiple grips, but Johnny has even worked on full control of the elbow, wrist, meaning flexion, extension, ulnar radio deviation, open, close, point, pinch, and individual finger control. I mean, that is how robust the pattern rec system is. That is how robust that, and key, that virtual system that the APL folks have designed. As far as a thumbs up, we can, we, we can choose, he chooses or he can decide which um, motions that he's going to train at any given time and, and the number of different motions you're training does start to get. It's kind of one of these things, you know, the more things you kind of put into that mix, the harder it gets. Um, you know, and Johnny keeps building on the number of things he can control simultaneously. So he could, we, he, he could decide that one of the things he wants is a thumbs up. So today he, the grips he wanted to kind of highlight here were the point and the spherical grip, and so we trained those up. Um, and he, tr he t teaches the system, this is what my command for those motions are. Um, and so those are, that's, that's him training the system. We just kind of opened the doorway for him to, sh to show that. Showing off. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things that I, I think I'd like to add to that is that, um, so if you, if you move your arm, there, there's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 million neurons involved in that. Yeah, give or take a couple. All right. So we're maybe looking at, yeah, if we're lucky, 10, 20, 30, 40 of them. Okay. And so, so what you heard about in the, in the video and the research project uh, that, that you heard about was really to take that information and then use advances in machine intelligence and computer vision and things to augment that so that you know, when I think about, you know, I want to pick up a glass off the table, I don't think about, you know, how I want to position my hand and make sure I don't let the glass slip and um, don't spill it, you know, things like that. Uh, I'd like to be able to do all that automatically. And so this is where we talk about this being a very inter interdisciplinary kind of effort. We're able to take, you know, these other disciplines and merge them together in a way that we can really provide some just phenomenal capability that, you know, to, to Johnny or any other user is just, well, I'm thinking about picking up that, that glass, but there's a whole lot of other things that, that, that go on once those signals leave the, you know, the nerves and go into the electronics. Please. I have two questions. One question is, when, when did your journey start, Johnny? Mm -hmm. And the other question is, is this arm made just to fit Johnny, or can this arm be Very fit? Good question. Can it's be good question. on anybody? My journey began in 2005. That's when I was <clears throat> told that I had cancer. They did six surgeries, 39 radiation treatments, trying to cut it and burn it out. Couldn't stop it. Couldn't slow it down. So I was told that they would have to amputate the arm and hopefully they'd get above it because if the cancer would have got here, I'd had three to six months to live. And so once I was deemed, you know, that uh, they took the arm, I was cancer free, I was going to pay forward. All the, the military people coming back, I had, I've got a, a son and, and two, two stepkids that was in a service. They, they each come back with their extremities, but they had buddies that didn't. And so I had a chance to donate my life to try to help, you know, those and any other amputee out there. And so that's where I've devoted my life to. That's what gives me my drive. And as far as is the arm made for me, no. This arm can be, can be operated by any amputee whether they're amputated at the wrist, any part of the forearm, any part of the upper arm, or clear up to the shoulder or tick. They can, each one of them can have the same opportunity to, that I've got pending, you know, on, with the, uh, that they don't have any nerve damage, you know, severe nerve damage that, that we, can't, we couldn't tap into in order to give them the control to work this. We have another online question, I believe. Uh, Denny, here's another question from an online. Programming language is used. Oh. That's it. The online viewer asks, can you guys hear me? 
Mm -mm. No. What, what programming language? What programming language is used? The online viewer is asking what programming language is used to operate the arm. I can, I can answer that one. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> He's a philosopher, right? He knows the, the answer. Um, I mean, so the work I did um, was mainly in Python and C++. So the, the framework that's used for the arm is uh, something called the robot operating system. It's called ROS. And uh, the framework of ROS is built um, in C++. So uh, being able to you know, write some code in that, in addition to doing some higher level stuff in Python, uh, was particularly effective. Um, but there are also various engineers who work on um, on the lower level as well, like developing like, the circuit boards and doing more like, assembly code as well. So I'd like to add to that. Uh, one of the things that we did very intentionally, so we made this limb modular. We also made it with uh, open standards. Um, so that, you know, the idea was that anybody can program something, uh, use this arm, okay? And, and so it's not a, a, a closed architecture. Because part of what we wanted to do also was to, to provide a capability to stimulate the, the research community. So for example, we have the virtual system, which has been mentioned. And we have, I don't know, probably 20 or so different research groups all using that virtual system in their, in their laboratories. And we regularly have people come in and, and try things out. And, on the arm, we've had the arm in many other, other laboratories. And so we're, part of what we're hoping to do here is really give students the opportunity to, to essentially build apps for this, right? So you know, we have this really capable robotic arm that Johnny's using right now, but you can envision this arm being used for all kinds of things. So it could be used you know, in somebody's house that, that has a, you know, some type of of disability, it could be used in a, in a factory setting to operate in a dangerous environment. It's only really limited by our imagination. And so what we really wanted to do is kind of open this up so that, you know, you know, any student or research group could kind of come in and just, you know, just let their imagination run wild and, and just try anything. Yes, uh, first of all, Johnny, I'd love to be at your house Halloween night to see you hand out candy to kids. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is, you mentioned, this might be for Dr. Chi, and thank you for your service, sir. Oh, thank um, you. That uh, you mentioned in working with patients with spinal cord injuries, wouldn't the patient have to have the neural pathways between the brain and whatever extremity you're trying to replace when those neural pathways have to be otherwise unimpeded? You're absolutely right. And that's the beauty of this advanced robotic limb system. There is another project we're a part of, uh, which we've called Harmony. And it's applied, or the application, for people with spinal cord injury. And it's is exactly right. Because of their spinal cord injury, those neural connections past the cord aren't being projected down to the muscles and things that they would normally need in order to actuate a movement. What we've been able to integrate is using eye control, computer vision using a Kinex, and this advanced robotic limb system. We've now created a system, literally you are looking through life as if you're in a point of view video game. So I don't know if a lot of you have children, grandchildren, you see them when they're playing um, Call of Duty, you know, they're running, going through their environment, they see some objects on the ground, literally they use their joystick, highlight that particular environment, they can pick that um, object up, interact with it, do whatever they want with it. It's very similar to that type of um, interface and ease for user interaction. And we've applied this to the advanced limb. That's, Farhan was working on some of that computer vision. Um, we are currently in the efforts of some fundraising to bring this system to one of my personal mentors is uh, Dr. Thomas Wachtel. He's a retired Navy captain, but also a trauma surgeon that uh, was injured in a motor vehicle accident that left him paralyzed below the neck. And complete, very tragic, I was injured, I get a little choked up even thinking about it, but injured during my chief year um, during training, he reached out to myself and Mike to see if he could come to APL to work um, with our Harmony system. And secretly, his wife called me up and said, there is no way Tom can make the, this um, trip from Phoenix to Baltimore. I mentioned it to Mike, and Mike said, well, if Tom can't come to us, maybe we can go wow. to Tom. And um, this summer, we tried, um, again, looking for kind of atypical funding sources, started a Kickstarter campaign in order to bring this harmony system. And Tom, again, would be the first 
the spinal cord injury patient to interact with the system. And we didn't make our funding goals, but actually caught the eye of a private donor that we're currently talking with, and again, thinking of supporting this particular project. So um, thank you for that question, and thank you for that lead-in for the kind of our, our other um, projects that we're involved in, but also really the, the kind of crisis we're at of trying to find funding in order to bring this wonderful technology to incredible patients, incredible stories that they wouldn't have otherwise access to. So one more question. And thank you. Yeah, I see a lot of arms there, so clearly a lot of conversation. We can continue this conversation later on. So, you know. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, I haven't heard every single question, so I hope I'm not repeating something. Mm -hmm. How important um, would a, a mindfulness practice be in uh, producing positive outcomes? How important is mind over matter uh, in making this uh, development this change? I, I just want to give a little anecdotal story to that. I mean, just in working with Johnny and working with the patients. Um, so he's controlling this with his arm down here, you know. But um, when you're really trying to do something and you can't achieve it, you kind of get tense and you go like this and, and whatnot. And, and we have to really kind of say when we're doing early training, as I, I would always say to Johnny, take a deep breath, relax your shoulders, because even Breathe. though the control is down here, he, he can't make it work. If it, and so John, the, the relaxation part between commands is actually more as important or more important than the other commands. And so Johnny's really gotten good at just, you know, relaxing in between, and, and that's part of that, but there's a huge mind. It's very much a biofeedback exercise in learning how to use the arm, mm -hmm. and you get the feedback when it's not, when it's doing something you don't want. Sometimes it's just, you could, you know, it's not working, it's not working. Okay, take a deep breath. <sighs> now ask, and it, and it goes, and it goes and does what, what you want it to do. So it's, it's if, I don't know if that answers your question, but it is really kind of interesting how it, it kind of creates this, this biofeedback environment that's not something we purposefully or, or, or track in a quantitative way, but it's definitely a real phenomenon that almost every patient has expressed, and they get better and better the more they can kind of settle into the system. I'd like to just add kind of one thing to build on that uh, as we, we uh, kind of think about it. That's a great question. And one of the things that we did in this, this program, uh, Albert mentioned we're doing uh, brain, direct brain interfaces. And we took one of those patients and we essentially unplugged the MPL and plugged her into a flight simulator. And we said, okay, go fly the plane. And within minutes, she's actually off with the flight simulator. And after about an hour, he asked her, what did she think about? Because we told her, you know, you could control the plane by think thinking about moving your wrist. She said, you know, I really forgot about moving the wrist. I was just thinking about moving the plane. And so what it, you know, what it says is that, we're, you know, you think about that, what that means. This is somebody that hasn't been able to move in years, and they're, they're able to fly a plane. Can you imagine just how freeing that experience was for that person? And she she so didn't it, have flight experience. And she had no flight she had experience, no flight right. Experience, yes. and, and she certainly flew it better than I would have. Um, <laughs> But it, you know, it really shows that we're, you know, with this, we're, you know, the, the ability to kind of tap, to tap into the brain really puts us on the cusp of, of really revolutionizing the way people can interact with machines and the way we can improve, improve lives. And it's just, you know, it's just, a, just, I feel very privileged to have been, you know, involved in this program and working with, with such a great team to, to bring this to this point. It's thank you. Not our panelists, our pioneers. Amazing. I was so inspired. I think uh, everyone here was inspired. Uh, thank you so very much. Thank you.